So it's been over a week since RE2 Remake officially released worldwide to much fanfare, selling over 3 million copies in just a few days, and to my surprise, becoming one of the most publicly well-received video games I've ever seen. I was totally not expecting this, but I think the game's quality definitely speaks for itself. As you may already know, I made a spoiler-free review for this game shortly before it released. I very much enjoyed RE2 Remake, but because of review embargoes, I obviously wasn't allowed to talk about a bunch of gameplay and story events in my review. Now that the game's out and plenty of people have both played and enjoyed it, I thought it'd be a great idea to cover everything I couldn't talk about in my initial review and some of the things I purposely left out because I thought they may spoil your experience. Experience. You could think of this video as sort of a B scenario to my first RE2 review. I'll leave a link down in the description to my original review for this game. Maybe go check that video out before watching this one. If the title isn't clear enough, this video will contain spoilers, so watch at your own risk. I've been very excited to talk fully about this game ever since I played it, so without wasting any more time, let's take a deeper bite out of Resident Evil 2 2019. In my original review, there were a few smaller things that I left out on purpose, and one gameplay mechanic that I unfortunately forgot to talk about. So let's get that stuff out of the way before talking about story-related gameplay stuff. I really liked RE2's photorealistic graphics, and I'm still amazed with the overall design of the environments and character models. After replaying the game a few times, I noticed some other visual things that really stuck out to me. Some of these graphical elements are good, and some of them are a little weird. First up, this game is really dark like in terms of lighting. Your character will use a flashlight to illuminate the environment you'll be exploring through. I really like this, but I kind of wish that in the RPD, you can restore more of the precinct's power. A lot of the rooms and hallways remain dark for the entire game, but some rooms actually have light switches that you could turn on and off. I was hoping that at some point we'd be able to explore a fully lit up RPD. I feel like it'd be great because then we could see all of the detail put into these amazingly crafted rooms. It was a little disappointing, but there actually is a level later on in this game that you can completely light up like I wanted with the RPD, but we'll talk about that specific place a little later. As amazing as these environments look, I did notice this strange, shiny floor polish effect on a lot of the game's surfaces. It looks fine in the RPD, but later on in the game, once you reach the lab area, you can see this same effect on multiple surfaces, like the ceiling, but it has this weird warping effect. It was hard to ignore. This wasn't too immersion breaking, but it was still distracting when it showed up. Other than that tiny little visual element, this game still looks awesome. Finally, a gameplay feature that I completely forgot to mention in my review is this game's ammo crafting. RE2 2019 has a similar ammo crafting system to Resident Evil 3's. As you play through the game, you'll be finding different types of gunpowder that you can mix together to create different types of ammo for certain guns. Leon and Claire both get different colored powder that they can mix to create specific ammo for their respective firearms. This feature has been streamlined though. Now you no longer need the reloading tool to mix the powder. You can just do it on the fly. Obviously, this is really cool because on repeat playthroughs, you can strategically craft stronger ammo in the beginning of the game and then be fully stocked up on something like magnum ammo when you need it for a boss fight. I really like when games reward me for thinking ahead of time. Okay, now let's talk about story-related spoiler stuff. I was really excited to play through the new levels involving Ada Wong and Sherry Bergen. If you're unfamiliar, the original RE2 featured levels with these characters, but both levels were the same where you had to do a pretty boring crate-pushing puzzle to progress through the story. This time, each character has a completely unique goal to accomplish, an environment to explore. Sherry's scenario sees her trapped in the all-new Raccoon City Orphanage. After being kidnapped by Chief Irons and locked in one of the orphanage's rooms, your goal is to find the key to the front door and escape. I have to say that the writers on this game did a really great job at making Chief Irons even creepier than he already was in the original game. The orphanage's back room doubles as Irons' taxidermy workplace. We even get to see the body of the mayor's daughter laid out on a table like in the original game. As Sherry, we have to run from Irons and sneak around him, waiting for the right moment to snatch up his key and escape. I remember when RE7 came out, I read online about how a lot of people that dealt with childhood trauma and abuse found Jack really terrifying. In RE2, the devs pretty much took that feedback and pushed it much further in this situation. Physically seeing a small child hiding from an angry adult who's screaming and tearing the place up is really unsettling, but also very effective in the horror department. This part of the game is really straightforward and reminded me of hide-and-seek horror games like Amnesia and Outlast. Honestly, I don't really like those kinds of games 
games, but I think it's funny how Capcom did that exact gameplay style for this level, and they absolutely nailed it. I really liked this part of the game. It's very compelling, and you don't have to push a single crate the entire time. Ada's section takes place in the sewers, just like the second time we played as her in the original game. After Leon is shot by Annette Birkin, Ada patches him up and begins pursuing Annette. In this part of the game, you'll be dodging past zombies and using Ada's unique EMF visualizer. This device helps you find hidden electrical power sources that you have to manipulate to bypass certain obstacles. I don't really understand how Ada has technology like this. It seems a little futuristic for 1998, but I'll give it a pass because I love Ada so much. Ada also has a quick run-in with Mr. X. On your first playthrough, this part can be kind of difficult, but once you know where all of the power sources are, you can activate each of them very fast and quickly escape from X. I really liked this section because I'm a big fan of Ada, and thematically it's pretty cool because your goal is to pursue Annette while also being pursued by Mr. X. You know, it's it's like poetry, it sorta of, sorta of rhymes. Gameplay-wise, this level is pretty good too. It doesn't outstay its welcome, and the EMF puzzles are pretty fun. Speaking of the sewers, this actually leads us into the next part of the game that I wanted to talk about. Like I said in my review, the sewers are a lot better than what they used to be in the original RE2. This part of the game comes right after the RPD, and as both characters, your goal is to find either Sherry or Ada, depending on who you're playing as. And you'll be solving one of the bigger puzzles in the game, and also taking on a brand new threat. While most of the sewer is brand new and redesigned content, the main area is straight out of RE298, and it looks really awesome. By the way, in my review, I mentioned that a part of this game felt very set PC, like it didn't belong at all. What I was talking about is Leon's run-in with the giant alligator. So in Leon's game, once you reach the sewers, the alligator will attack Leon, initiating an on-rails, run-at-the-screen set piece. This is like straight out of Jake's campaign in RE6. It's so jarring because the entire game up to this point gives you full control over everything you do. I guess in the original, you also just ran away from the gator and then blew it up, but it just feels so weird in this game. I still like it though. If anyone's gonna have an action-packed, heavily scripted set piece, it should be Leon. Anyway, back to the sewers. The new enemy you'll be facing down here are the horrifying G-Adult monsters. These creatures are massive abominations that hide underwater and jump out at you when you least expect it. These monsters have replaced the original giant spiders that we fought in RE298 sewers. Like the spiders, the G-Adults also have poison vomit attacks. And this time, when you're poisoned, not only does your HP continuously drain, but your character will start randomly coughing uncontrollably, canceling out any actions like aiming and running. This is terrifying because you have no control over it. You you immediately have to use a blue herb if poisoned. This makes these giant monsters even more threatening than they look. The G monsters can also be countered by using a defense item during their vomit attack, canceling out the risk of becoming poisoned. These creatures are great, and my favorite thing about them is that if you're far away, you'll hear a low humming. It'll kinda sound like music, but as you get closer to them, that humming music will quickly turn into their disturbing, painful screaming. It's very unnerving. On a brighter note, the sewer puzzle is an expanded version of the chess piece puzzle from the original RE2. This time, both characters have to do it, and you'll have to work out where each chess piece is supposed to be positioned on either wall. I like this puzzle because the chess pieces are scattered all throughout the sewer, and as you look for them, you'll have to keep an eye out for the G-monsters hiding underwater. It's really cool and keeps you on edge at all times. Another really great thing about the sewer is that you can find a secret passageway that leads you to an elevator that takes you back up into the RPD. With this option available to you, you can actually return to the police station and gather up any items you missed on your first visit. It's super cool. Inter Interconnected worlds are my jam. The boss you'll be fighting in the sewer is William Birkin's second form. The first phase of this fight is similar to the scene in the original RE2, where Birkin is punching his claw through the roof of the cable car. In this game, he's hiding up in the ceiling of a generator room, trying to punch down at you instead. The main part of the battle takes place in an outside arena where you have to stun Birkin with firearm damage, and then use a crane to smack him off the ledge of the platform you're both standing on. I like this fight because it's very action-packed without taking away your control. Also, it's just really satisfying smacking Birkin around with a giant storage container. It's really great. Much like the original RE2, after the sewer you'll be moving on to the Umbrella Laboratory via a cable car. Sadly, RE298's original factory and marshalling yard don't appear in the 2019 version. Instead, we literally go straight from the sewer to the lab, which in this game is called The Nest. While it's not a huge problem, I feel that the marshalling yard and factory were very iconic locations in the original RE2. 
Capcom has even remade these specific areas a bunch of times in their other Resident Evil spin-off games, so it was really surprising to see that they just weren't in the game at all. With all of that said, I still really enjoyed the redesigned Umbrella Lab. The nest is the complete opposite of the original industrial lab of RE298. Where the original felt very cold and ominous, the nest feels like it was once a very nice and comfortable place to work. The main shaft area from the original game does show up in this remake, and I feel it does recapture that same mysterious feeling we all got from the original RE2's lab. The nest is the place I mentioned earlier that you can completely light up, by the way. As soon as I stepped through the front entrance, I was blown away because the reception area looked so nice. Don't get me wrong though, when you go deeper, there are still zombies and dead bodies everywhere, and also a familiar monster that has been completely reimagined. I am of course talking about the ivies. The ivy monsters in this game look very different. In the original RE2, they were literally plant-like humanoids. In the 2019 version, the best description for the new ivies I can come up with is tree zombies. You can tell that these monsters were once human beings that were fused with plant life, rather than them being an evolution of plant DNA. I really like the new design, it fits this game's more realistic tone. What I don't like about these monsters is that from all of my experience with them, they only seem to have one attack. That being a one-hit kill grab move, that you absolutely have to counter with a defense item. This is pretty lame because in the original, the IVs had both melee and ranged attacks that would also deal poison damage. Now it's like you just have to keep your distance or risk reloading your game. I've never really been a fan of one-hit kill enemies in video games, so this was a little disappointing. The boss of the lab is William Birkin's third form, but like in the original game, each character also have their own separate boss to fight at the very end of the lab section. I don't have a lot to say about Birkin's G3 form. I think it's really good. He looks amazing, but the fight is also very simple. You just have to shoot his eyes until he drops dead. Very good boss fight, very Resident Evil. I'm much more eager to talk about each character's final boss. For Leon, we have to square off with Mr. X one final time on the lab's cargo elevator. By the way, I absolutely love Super X's redesign. In this game, he doesn't fall into a vat of lava and come out powered up. Instead, he's caught in the middle of an explosion that tears off half of his face and also the upper part of his trench coat, revealing a massive, pulsating heart and his grotesque and mangled claw. He looks exactly like a combination of Nemesis and Resident Evil 1 Tyrant. I would be lying if I said I didn't cheer when I saw this the first time. I actually died quite a few times during this battle on my first playthrough. X's attacks are really fast and have a very wide hit range. You'll have to start running as soon as you see him winding up his strikes. He also still has the lunging attack where he can fly at you from across the platform. Once you do enough damage, he'll start using this one hit kill charge move and this is what killed me the most in this battle. As soon as you see him charging up, just start firing away. After laying down enough damage, Ada will once again drop you the rocket launcher from the shadows. And oh my god, it's the quad barrel rocket launcher from Resident Evil 1. Pick it up and pull the trigger to kill X once and for all. Badass. I love this boss so much, and I'm really glad the devs didn't go with the original design. It might have looked a little too anime for this game. Also, the track that plays in this fight is actually epic. In Claire's ending, we fight William Birkin's fourth form on the iconic turntable train platform. This battle starts with you picking up a minigun, and I gotta say, when I first opened the door to the control room and laid eyes on this beautiful weapon, I was so pumped up to use it, and I sure as heck wasn't disappointed with what followed. This battle is great. The monstrous Birkin runs around the platform on all fours attacking wildly. He can also climb up the tunnel walls and jump down at you, but you can actually shoot him down if your aim is on point. After a full game of conserving ammo and playing carefully, getting the chance to let loose on a big monster with an insanely powerful gun felt really great. This battle is pretty simple. All you have to do is shoot at Birkin, and obviously the eyes that form on his body are his weak points. Great boss fight and a great ending to Claire's story. So you may have noticed that I couldn't really talk about how the A and B scenarios worked in my review. Just like before, once you finish a character's A scenario, the B scenario for the other character will unlock on the main menu screen. There aren't many differences between the stories of each character's A and B scenarios, besides a few cutscenes, those being who gets to meet Marvin in the beginning, and who gets to fight Bergen's final form on the train. 
All of the major differences between A and B are all gameplay related. So in the B scenario, items, puzzle solutions, and enemy locations will be different, and Mr. X will actually start stalking you much closer to the beginning of the game, effectively making the B scenario a little bit harder. Both characters have a set story in this game. That means Claire will always fight G4 Birkin at the end of both of her scenarios, and the same goes for Leon fighting Super X in his scenarios. I can see people not liking this change, but honestly, I don't really have a problem with it. The devs took the best parts from both characters' A and B stories and the original RE2 and put them all into one canon string of events for this game. So yeah, Leon will kiss Ada, this time in the cable car, and also see her get shot by Annette in the same scenario. If you're unaware, both of those situations are similar to Leon's original A and B endings in RE298. That means that you'll be experiencing this set of events in both of Leon's A B scenarios. I know it might sound bad, but I personally would rather have one very well-written story with small changes on repeat playthroughs, because I only ever played Claire A, Leon B in the original game anyway. That was pretty much my canon story. With that being said, in my review I did talk about how I noticed a story inconsistency in this game, and that's when both Claire and Leon encounter Annette and G3 Birkin in the same exact way, supposedly minutes apart from one another. I played this game my first time, Claire A, Leon B, and everything was going really great up until I got to this point. So for me, Claire found the vaccine for Sherry, got attacked by Birkin, got help from Annette, defeated Birkin, and then returned to Sherry as they both watched Annette die in front of them. Now the game expects me to believe in Leon B. After all of that just happened, Leon finds the G sample for Ada, gets attacked by Birkin, Annette apparently faked her death and runs back to help Leon take down Birkin again, Leon defeats Birkin, and then Annette shoots Ada right before dying one last time. If it isn't obvious, this is a massive plot inconsistency. And the worst part is that all of this can be easily fixed by having Leon or Claire just not fight G3 Birkin and meet up with Annette in the B scenario. I'm actually really curious how this happened when all of the other scenes are so beautifully written and planned out. I'm not the only one that noticed this either. It seems to be the one problem that most people have with this game, and I'd even put myself in that group of people. The only way this inconsistency works is if you treat certain parts of the A scenario as if they don't happen while playing the B scenario, and vice versa. So for example, in Claire A, she would still do all of the important things like save Sherry, just without fighting any of the bosses. That means Leon would be doing everything he does while fighting the bosses after all of the Claire stuff. Sounds really complicated. Ever since I finished my first playthrough, I've been thinking of the game in this way, and it definitely helps me to not think of this part as a plot hole anymore, but it's still super strange to me that this even happened at all. Just to be clear, this inconsistency doesn't take away anything from the rest of the game's stellar design. It's just really weird that it got past testing. Maybe my reading of the scenarios was intentional? I doubt it though. Besides the inconsistency, I think the story overall is amazing. There are so many little nuances to all of the character performances that make them all stand out in unique and memorable ways, just like the original RE2. One of my favorite side characters was Marvin. I love how he acts differently depending on who you choose in the A scenario. Being more nice and level-headed when talking to Claire, because you can tell that Marvin has a deep respect for her brother Chris. It's a different story when Marvin talks to Leon. He really feels like Leon's stern cop dad. Obviously, he cares for Leon's safety, but he's also more realistic with him about the current situation. The writers did such a great job at building up Marvin's character throughout the opening hours of the game. So when he finally turns, it's really heartbreaking to see. The game just leaves you to put him out of his misery too. I couldn't do it right away. It was a really tough moment for me because I liked his character a lot. It's not just Marvin who got extra attention in the character building department, but every side character in this game has so much more depth than what they originally had. You can glean a lot from these excellent performances. I said it in my review, but seeing the chemistry between Leon and Ada was also very sweet. Seeing these two characters grow together and develop a genuine relationship and trust for one another, only to have Ada betray Leon in the end, was shocking, even though I already knew it was gonna happen. This is exactly what a remake should hope to accomplish, giving you those same thrills but in a brand new way is the ultimate goal, and RE2 2019 definitely accomplishes its goals in pretty much every area of its design. For me, this game is almost perfect. It's like right there, almost a 10 out of 10. Very small problems are holding it back from achieving that perfect 10 though. Very, very small problems. It's interesting because RE2 definitely feels like a massive big budget AAA video game with its presentation and story, but it also feels so classic in its design, not sacrificing on any of its amazing gameplay mechanics. 
mechanics. I used to think that we'd never see a video game that had both realistic graphics and very good gameplay, but with games like RE2, it seems like we're finally getting there. Even after replaying this game over and over and unlocking most of the bonus content, I want to keep playing this game because it's just so good. I want to keep improving my completion times and hanging out in these awesome environments taking in the scenery. I honestly still can't believe that we actually got a full Resident Evil 2 remake after all of these years, and it's both a new experience and overwhelmingly amazing. I cannot wait for what Capcom has in store for us for the future of Resident Evil. Nemesis, bring it on. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this follow-up video to my RE2 review. I've played this game so many times ever since I got it. I love it so much. It seems like everyone else really enjoyed it too, and that makes me very happy. Anyway, if you liked this video, please consider subscribing if you haven't already, and checking out my Patreon link down in the description. I offer a lot of cool bonuses to the people who pledge to me there. By the way, I have started streaming more on my Twitch channel, I actually streamed all of RE2 Remake recently, and it was really fun. I'll be leaving a link to my Twitch down below for you guys as well. Anyway, I'll see you all in the next video. Later!